Welcome to the second part of Unit 3. In this part, we're going to look at a specific uh, application of the constant acceleration equations, and that is to projectile motion. Uh, in one dimensional, for the moment, uh, in I think week five, we get to two dimensional projectile motion, if I remember the course progression correctly. Um, so for projectile motion, what is our acceleration? The acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity. It always points downward. Notice I didn't say it's always negative. It always points downward. As soon as you say negative, you've implied a coordinate system. Okay. And it has a value of 9.8 meters per second squared near the surface of the Earth. Typically, the variable we use for this acceleration is little g for gravity. Okay. I said last um, part that I would give you a slide on how to work these accel uh, constant acceleration problems. So here is that slide. You saw me model it last time. Um, draw a picture. Make sure you define your positive direction. Choose your position for x equals zero. That's your choice, so choose it. Unless the problem specifically states put it somewhere, then put it somewhere. Um, indicate with arrows the directions of your initial velocity and your acceleration. You may know values as well, and if you do, you can put them on. But bare minimum, indicate their directions so that you can think about them in your coordinate system. Okay. Next step is to write what I call your grocery list. It's a list of your variables what you know, what you don't know, what you want to know. Just again, to help you organize your work for this problem. Okay, the next thing you need to do is look at your equations and identify a way to find the thing that you want to know. And as we saw in the example for part one, sometimes you may need to solve for an intermediate variable before you can find your answer. Um, the other thing that comes up a lot in projectile motion is uh, things that aren't necessarily stated, but are known. So for example, the object that goes up at the very top of its motion has to stop momentarily before it can turn around and come back down. And because it has to stop momentarily at the top, the velocity at the top is zero. The other thing we have is symmetry. Because the acceleration is constant, the time it takes to go from a certain position up to the top equals the time it takes to go from the top back down to that same position. Similarly, the distance the, the projectile travels from um, bottom to top equals the distance from top to bottom. Those symmetry arguments do not hold hold if you have air resistance or or something like that that you're working with okay for this particular part i am going to work a fairly simple uh, projectile motion problem but i'm going to work it twice and the reason i'm going to work it twice is because i'm going to change up the coordinate system to show how you can work the same problem with different coordinate systems, different initial uh, assumptions like where do you put the position equal to zero and still get the same answer out. Okay. So without further ado, here is that problem. We have a ball drop from rest from a height of 20 meters and we want to know how long does it take for the ball to hit the ground. And for this example, you can see I've even labeled it at the top. We're going to let up be positive. So step one, draw a picture. So we have somewhere up here uh, our t equals zero time. And at t equals zero, we have a ball and it is sitting at rest. So I'm labeling v equals zero meters per second. Down below at time t, which is what I want to know. What time does it hit the ground? 
Another way of asking the same question would be how long does it take or how long does it fall before it hits the ground? So at t equals some unknown time, the ball is now down here. And because the ball is down here, it has a new position, it has a new velocity, it has other things going. Now for this one I say specifically I'm going to let up be positive. And the most logical thing it, that I could do for up equals positive is to let position equal zero here at the bottom, which means my initial position up here is 20 meters, a positive 20 meters above it. That's given in the problem. Okay. Again, my choice. Not the only choice I could make, but my choice. It makes sense to me. The last thing I need to do is uh, indicate my acceleration is downward at g and my picture is now complete. So I move to my grocery list again x, x naught, v, v naught, a, and t. So position at time t, I look down here and I say, oh, I let that be my zero position. Position at t equals zero is up here. That's my 20 meters. My velocity at time t, I don't have anything drawn there. I don't know what it is. So hopefully I don't need to know it because I got no information on it at this point. Initial velocity though, I see up here, this should have been a V naught. Doesn't really matter because I've got it labeled with a T equals zero, but my initial velocity up here is zero, so I can label that. I see my acceleration is downward and has a magnitude of G, so since up is positive, my acceleration is gonna be a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And again, T is what I wanna know. So I have lots of information here. And what I want to know is time. So if I look at those four constant acceleration equations and think about them, the first one, x equals x naught, that one, that is a promising equation. T is a little bit buried in it. I mean, we got t and t squared terms, so Let's sit on it for a minute and go just look at the rest of them. The next one down says V equals V naught plus AT. Well, it has T, but it also has that V that I don't know. So I'm going to skip that equation for the moment. Maybe I have to come back to it. The one below it, V squared equals V naught squared and so on. Um, that one doesn't involve T. However, it would let me find V. So one path I could take through the math is to use that third one to find V and then plug it into the second one to find T. Okay, well, that's one possibility. And then the fourth equation is the one for the average velocity and it doesn't involve T and it doesn't really help me find V. So that fourth one isn't useful in this case. That leaves me with two options for completing my task. I can deal with the x equals x naught formula, even though it looks a little scary because it's got the t term and the t squared term, or I can first solve for v using the v squared formula and then plug that into the v equals v naught formula to find t. Personally, one step sounds better than two. So I'm going to choose to use this formula, x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. And now I'm gonna plug numbers in. So I can do that by just looking at my grocery list. I see the position is zero. The initial position is 20. The initial velocity is zero. And then plus one half my acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared t squared. And even though it looked scary, I realize this isn't that bad because of that v naught equaling zero. It got rid of the t term, makes it much easier. Okay, so now I'm going to do a little bit of algebra. I'm going to move 
uh, take 9.8, divide by 2, and move it to the other side of the equation, which makes that a positive 4.9 meters per second squared t squared equals 20 meters. Or in other words, t squared equals 20 divided by 4.9. 20 divided by 4.9. So t squared is 4.08 seconds squared. And so to find the answer, I've got to square root that answer. And I get an answer of 2.2. Two, no, 2.02. .02. So for all intents and purposes, two seconds. Now, one thing to remember, one thing to remember is technically when you take a square root, you get two possible answers. So the answer could be two seconds or the answer could be negative two seconds and you have to choose the correct one. Well, it makes sense here that, you know, time is moving forward. so you choose the positive root, okay? And that's what we did, so t equals two seconds. Okay, I have a couple of blank slides built in just so that I can draw if I need to. Wasn't sure how much space it would take. Now I'm gonna work the exact same problem, exact same problem, but I'm gonna rearrange my coordinate system. Specifically, I'm gonna change positive to down. So again, beginning my, my drawing, I have up here, my t equals zero. I know it's not moving up here. I'm gonna let down be positive. Acceleration is downward and it hits down here somewhere. So up here I have x naught and down here I have x. And now I see, hey, down is positive. So if I start at zero up here, then my x down here will be a positive number. And that makes that positive 20 meters. Okay, I think, oh, and I need to label that this is my t equals question mark. So now that I have everything set up again, I can write my grocery list. So my final position in this case is a positive 20 meters. My initial position is zero meters. That velocity, I still don't know, still not gonna write anything in there. Initial velocity of again, zero. Acceleration, my acceleration is downward, positives downward, so my acceleration is now positive 9.8 meters per second squared. And the T is again the thing I want to know. And just like last time, I am going to use the exact same formula. And plugging in numbers, I get 20 meters equals zero meters plus uh, zero meters per second times T plus one half times 9.8 meters per second squared T squared which gives me that 20 meters equals 4.9 t, oop, 4.9 meters per second squared t squared. And now if you look, the left and right hand sides are flopped, but I have the exact same equation I had the first time I worked this problem. So I get t squared equals, what was it, 4.08 second squared, which means t equals 2.0 seconds for all intents and purposes. So I chose a different x equals zero position. I rotated my coordinate system, so down was positive. And because I worked the problem self-consistently, I got the exact same answer. This concludes this part of unit three. In unit three, part two, we are going to work a couple more uh, projectile motion uh, examples that are slightly more involved and more complicated.